Hi, I'm Pastor Chris Driggs of Bolivia Baptist Church in Bolivia, North Carolina. Welcome into our weekend message for the weekend of January 31st, uh, fifth Sunday of first fifth Sunday of the new year. Uh, today, I want to complete my series that I've been bringing throughout most of January entitled "If Only I." And in that series, we talked about if only I hadn't done blank. And we talked about past sin and things that we regret and how they've affected our lives and how we can be forgiven and move forward uh, and leave it in the past. We said, if only I had more money. We talked about materialism and really the need for more of the Lord. And then last week, we talked about if only I could fix things. In other words, if only I could just right all the wrongs in the world fix everything in my life. And we talked about how really we don't have that ability to fix ourselves or to fix others. That's why we need the Lord. That's why Jesus had to die on the cross for us, because we just didn't have the ability to fix ourselves. Today, we're going to conclude the series with If Only I Could Understand. And I want to answer some questions we typically struggle to answer. Things in life that are often hard for us to understand. A uh, university student had to take an exam which had two parts, oral and written. And he didn't mind the written part, but, but was kind of really nervous about the oral part. So he asked one of his friends for some advice and was told that he shouldn't show any hesitancy because the examiners would kind of put that down to ignorance and that he had to give some sort of answer. Even if he didn't know the answer, he should at least try to give the impression that he had a good knowledge of the subject. So he entered the exam room, was asked by one of the oral examiners a really difficult question. It was in the science area, and it was in a particular area of science that he was not really all that familiar with. So he, he kind of put on a good face, and not being able to give any answer to the question, he said, I'm sorry, I've studied it and know the answer, but I've just forgotten it for the moment. Well, it seemed like it should have been sufficient, but one of the examiners said, what a tragedy. Scientists have been searching for an answer to that question for the last 2,000 years, and now you can't remember your answer. <laughs> I don't know about you, but even as a Christian, sometimes I struggle to understand life and come up with answers to things in life. Things happen that, that kind of cause us to have questions that are hard to answer and can even cause us to doubt. It's in those moments that we must rely on what we do know. For instance, we rely on our faith in God, which says he understands it all, even when we don't. So if we approach this message today with, with that one concept, that God knows it all, then our goal must be to gain his perspective on life in general in order to answer the tough questions of life. Of course, the place to go to gain his perspective is the Bible, and we're going to look at several verses kind of all over the place today. And that will give us answers to these questions if we're willing to take the time and, and dig a little deeper to find them in the Bible. So I'm going to ask three questions that nearly every person at some point asks in their life, some of which are found in the Bible itself. Very basic questions about life. And use these three as examples of how we can go to God's Word and begin to formulate an answer based on His character, His nature, and His truth. And then if you have other questions, hopefully you can then take some initiative in your life and go to God's Word and go to the Lord in prayer and begin to seek those answers from the one who has all the answers, and that's the Lord himself. So question number one is this. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? People ask that question a lot, and, and the answer really is kind of simple, but then we're going to expand upon it, help you help you understand it from, from a supportive standpoint. We live in a fallen world where all have sinned and, and are affected by the negative consequences of sin. Genesis 3 tells us about original sin, Adam and Eve's fall, and the curse that has come upon mankind as a result. So we can establish the truth that bad things happen to all people, because all are sinners. They don't just happen to good people, they happen to all people. The idea some Christians have that once they accepted Jesus, bad things would just kind of stop happening, they would become healthy, wealthy, and wise, is a fallacy. It's a lie. Yeah, yes, God does bless his children. I'm not saying he doesn't. He does it in many ways, including materially. But he doesn't put us in a protective bubble for the rest of our days on earth. He never promised that even. 
But the real issue here is how we define good and bad. What happens to good people is the question we're trying to answer. How do we define good and bad? What does it mean to be a bad person or a good person? Well, truth be told, we don't have a solid definition of it in our minds. To us, a lost person can be good simply because they look out for their neighbor. Or a person who's saved and is a child of God can be bad because they help start a church conflict somewhere along the way. Our definition of good and bad usually starts with the outward actions of a person because that's all we can see about them. But the Bible tells us God looks at the heart, and so we should pay attention to how he defines what is good and what is bad because he sees it and he knows it. Throughout this sermon, I'm, I'm not going to really pick up my Bible till the very end in, in the last point, but we're just going to have several verses. One is Mark 10, 18. Jesus says, no one is good except God alone. He is the definition of what is good. So when we make our judgments of what is good, we as humans compare others to ourselves and what we think, or to other people in general. But God compares us to himself leaving us all in a not-so-good situation because none of us rise to that level. Now, you might ask, aren't we better than those who don't know Christ? Well, we're certainly better off if we've accepted Jesus, and I hope our behavior is a reflection of that choice. But again, we're comparing ourselves to others in a way that can make us feel better about our shortcomings rather than taking them more seriously as an offense to a holy God. We need to stop trying to find subtle ways of kind of patting ourselves on the back, you know, and realize that the only way we'll have goodness in our lives is when we die to self and embrace the resurrected life of Christ in us. When we live more connected to Jesus, we'll live more like him who is good. Which brings us back to the question, but changes the question to a new one. Why do bad things happen to people who walk with the Lord. Now we're getting this good and bad thing as far as people thrown out. Why do bad things happen to people who walk with the Lord? Why does God allow bad things into the lives of Christians who are his children? Well, because Jesus told us trouble would still be a reality even for the believer, first of all. In John 16, 33, he said, in the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. As long as we're still on earth, Trouble will be a part of life for us. The difference for the believer is that we have Jesus as our consolation. Through his spirit, he will comfort us and give us courage to press on to the end when the world is changed and we finally reign with him. But the Christian life is not easy street. It wasn't for the disciples. It wasn't for the early church. It hasn't been throughout church history. I don't know why we tend to think in this day and age, especially in the United States of America, that we should not have to suffer and not have to go through problems because the church has been going through it since the very since its very inception. That's why Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 1 4, therefore we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. He says the Christian life leads to persecution and trouble but it provides the opportunity to persevere and show our steadfast faith to the world. Trouble is still part of life for the Christian because it gives us the chance to reveal our closeness to God. Listen, heaven is the place where all things will be good. Earth is the place where evil reigns for a season, and God's people let his goodness shine so that others might see the light and run to it. So bad things happen to good people, to Christian people, because that's life as it is on earth. Our calling is to persevere and overcome in Christ to the glory of God the Father. So it points others to him. So that's question number one. Question number two that can often be asked is, why does God heal some people and not others? And I know right now during COVID and, and all these this time of this season of life, it seems like I, I just see one person after another that's sick, not just with COVID, with other things and going through difficulty and some are healed and some pass away. And, and so I know many of you are hurting and you're going through difficult things right now with, with yourself or with friends or family. And, and, and maybe this is a question you're asking right now. Why does God heal some people and others and not others? Well, let me, let me follow that up with a couple other questions that we could ask in relation to that too. Maybe narrow it down a little bit. 
Another question we could ask in relation to that is, why does God heal some lost people and not heal some saved people? Again, we, we differentiate between the people of God and the people who are not in God's kingdom. And, and sometimes that's the question of a believer. And why does God heal some Christians and not others? Why doesn't he heal all Christians? Well, the answer to these questions is multifaceted, just like we can ask multiple questions like that. And the first thing we have to do is acknowledge that asking the question reveals that we have a man-centered sense of fairness when it comes to the miraculous. That we look at someone's life and judge if we think they are worthy of God's work in their life. You know, hey, they're lost. They're not worthy, Lord, but I'm saved. I should be healed of this. Or, Lord, uh, that person's a Christian, but, but, but they're not living right, and I'm living right. Why did they get healed and I'm still sick? You know, we, we kind of do that. Just like we talked about with, with bad things happening to good people, we kind of do that with this healing question, too. We might not say it, but we think it, or we feel that way, or we just never formulate that, that thought in our minds, but still it's kind of there. It, it's our natural tendency as humans to just kind of make those judgments based on how we see things and how we see other people. Well, supernatural healing is a work of God and is governed primarily by his sovereignty. That's the thing we must first remember. His works of healing are beyond our ability to understand, and therefore his choices in this or in any matter cannot be fully comprehended by the human mind. And they are his choices, and based on his sovereignty. And so we can second-guess him all we want, but it doesn't change the fact they're his choices and he knows what's best. So let me give the various thoughts that can help us accept his sovereign will when it comes to healing. It's just a handful of things here, four or five things. First is, God has a purpose in all things, even sickness and death. He has a purpose in all things, even sickness and in death. And you probably are agreeing with me on that, but in the moment when you're going through it, it's kind of hard to see that. It's kind of hard to understand that and accept that. Psalm 57, 2 says, I will cry to God most high, to God who accomplishes all things for me. Now, I selected that verse to throw in there because I want us to understand we have to be careful how we apply that verse. You know, modern, more progressive Christian thinkers will say that God loves us and will do whatever we need to make sure we're okay. <laughs> Again, that's man-centered. That's looking at our relationship with God and determining that God is focused on us. And that's not completely accurate. It's true, but not completely accurate. This verse is written by David while he was hiding in the cave from Saul. David knows he's been anointed by God to be the next king. That's not David's purpose. It's God's purpose for David. And there's a difference. So David understands that God will not let his own purposes, God's purposes, be thwarted and will therefore preserve David's life. He doesn't preserve David's life because David is a godly man. He preserves David's life because he has a purpose for preserving his life. If God has no more purpose for David, he might have let Saul kill him. Listen, we're all here on earth until God's purpose for us has come to a conclusion. And I don't know about you, but, but when God's finished with me, the best thing that could happen for me would be to die and immediately be in his presence. It really is. But he's not going to let that happen until he's done with me. And that might be when I'm 70, it might be when I'm 80, 90, or 100. He'll still be accomplishing some sort of purpose in me. That's why he'll leave me here. So ultimately, God heals those whose healing accomplishes his purposes, even if the person he heals is unsaved. He may have a purpose in that as well. Second thing about this is that God has good plans for all of his people. Now, this is similar, but not exactly the same. We take this from Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. For Israel, the plan was to preserve a remnant and rebuild the nation after the Babylonian exile. For us today, he's already given us a certain future and a certain hope in Christ Jesus. He's already given us that, and, and we know his plan for us is the completion of our salvation when we reach heaven. So his plan for us is good. 
Romans 8.28 says we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For the believer, even when sickness and death come, it's for our good in some way. It's part of the unfolding of God's plan for our lives or for the lives of those around us and subsequently our lives. You know, I hate to see a brother or sister in Christ suffer from cancer. But at the same time, if God has allowed it, then that suffering is part of God's unfolding plan for their life and even for those around them whom it affects. And that suffering in some way is meant to bring him glory. I may not understand it, but that's the reality of it from God's perspective. In both healing and suffering, God is still God who has a plan for our good and is always working the plan out. A third thing to think about when we're talking about healing is that God allows life and death as a natural ebb and flow in a fallen world. He gives life, but because of sin must allow for physical death, which is the outcome for all people. People are still born. People aren't just dying because of sin. People are still being born into this world, even though they're going to be sinners by nature. He still gives life. So it's a natural ebb and flow that people are born, and people die as a result of sin. Which leads me to the last thought on this. The healings in the Bible are intended to point us to our sin sickness and the real need for spiritual healing in Christ. God doesn't stop all sickness and dying because those things reveal what sin has done to us. Without these consequences, people wouldn't see a need for God. Now why God heals some Christians but not all Christians may simply be seen as him allowing his purposes and plans to play out. Those plans, even if they include suffering, are meant to bring that person or someone close to that person into a closer relationship with God himself. God is always trying to get man's attention and be glorified. And he didn't bring sin into the world. We did. And so we have to allow God to use the consequences of that sin to hopefully draw us closer to him. Now, of course, our behavior has an impact on whether we're healed or not. A chain-smoking Christian may die from cancer because of their choice, and God's will let them die as an example to others. That's true. But all things equal, God's purposes and plans often determine when healing gets him the glory and when it doesn't. For instance, sometimes God doesn't physically heal now so that someone in the situation can find spiritual healing later. All right, and I know that's just scratching, just barely touching the tip of the iceberg on that. You could go, I could preach a whole sermon on that, but I want to get to the third question now. Why do evil people prosper? And this is where we're going to get into the Bible in Jeremiah 12, 1 through 3, because the Bible actually, this is a question that's actually in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 12, 1 through 3, why do evil people prosper? And Jeremiah, in a prayer, says this, Righteous are you, talking to the Lord, O Lord, that I would plead my case with you. Indeed, I would discuss matters of justice with you. Boy, that's a that's a topic today. People are talking about justice all over our country today. Maybe we need to be talking with the Lord about it instead of each other and politicians and things. Why, he says, why has the way of the wicked prospered? Why are all those who deal in treachery at ease? You have planted them that they also that they have also taken root. They grow. They've even produced fruit. You are near to their lips, but far from their mind. But you know me, O Lord. You see me, and you examine my heart's attitude towards you. Drag them off like sheep for the slaughter, and set them apart for a day of carnage. Well, <laughs> that seems pretty harsh there at the end, but Jeremiah is prophesying in the years leading up to the Babylonian captivity, where God is going to judge Israel and Judah for their sins of idolatry, and what Jeremiah is kind of seeming to say here is, is that he wants him to take certain people. He's seeing his own countrymen act wickedly, and yet they seem to prosper. He's talking about his own people. He says, you planted them, clearly meaning God's people. And he says, then they've taken root. And he says that in verse 2. In other words, they've withstood the tests of time and remained right where they are, despite their idolatries. They've even produced fruit. They've been blessed of God. But, he says... You are near their lips, but far from their mind. They talk about God, but don't think highly of him. That's what's leading them into exile. And so Jeremiah issues this, but you know me, O Lord. I'm not like them. That's what he's saying. 
you see me and you examine my heart's attitude towards you, saying, what he's telling God is, God, there's a difference between me and them. They are being evil. Why are they prospering and I'm going through all this junk because I'm serving you? Because he was going through a lot. I mean, he was even put down in the bottom of a cistern and, and things like that. He, 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 was, he was really persecuted for his message. And so he declares himself to be a faithful man. And what he says is, hey, drag off the, sh the, the sheep that are unfaithful. Send them off and leave the rest of us here and just rebuild the nation with us. He's, he's pleading with God to let their enemies only take away the wicked from among them to purify the nation. Now, how do we answer this question then? Well, have you ever felt that way? Maybe you have, maybe you have concern in your country that you just wish God would just take all the evil people and remove them. But remember, we're not talking about the country. We're talking about the church. Have you ever prayed for God to remove wicked people from the church and only leave the truly faithful behind? That's essentially what Jeremiah is praying for. Yet God judges the whole of the nation here. He doesn't do what Jeremiah asks. So that means he also judges the whole of the church. It's not up to us to run up to God to run off the wicked from among us. It's up to us to convert them so that they become true members of the kingdom. In the New Testament, Jesus tells us that God allows the wheat and the tares, which is false wheat, to dwell in his kingdom with each other until the day of judgment. There are going to be people that are in the church, and I put that in quotation marks because there's the true church that's going to heaven, and then there's the church on earth that's made up of people, not all of whom are going to heaven. Uh, they may have walked an aisle, they may have even got baptized, uh, they may have ex said they accepted the Lord, but they've never really done it. They've just kind of done the church thing, you know? We're supposed to all dwell together, and as a pastor, I'm supposed to minister to the wheat and the tares at the same time. You know, I don't know, you won't know who they are. But if we keep preaching the message of the cross, then we do all we can to bring them into the faith. So evil people can look like they're part of God's people and can prosper right along with them. And that's what was happening in Jeremiah's time. They were being evil, but yet they were still prospering along with everybody else. But the larger question we're seeking to answer is, is why evil people in the world prosper, while God's people, for the most part, often barely get by. That's what we really are thinking. That's what we're really talking about. I just used Jeremiah to show us where the question was in the Bible and realized that what he was talking about related to the church. But what we're really trying to ask is, why is it that evil people in the world that have nothing to do with God, don't even come to church, prosper while God's people seem to barely get by most of the time? And that's not every per person in God's people, and it's not every person doesn't know God that, that, that prospers either. There's a lot of poor people that don't know God. But this is still a question that, that has been asked over the ages. And the answer to that question is not so complicated. Evil people prosper on the outside in this world, but the wicked are actually poor on the inside and heading for loss. The one who truly prospers is the one who has Jesus. Biblically speaking, Jesus offers insight on this issue in Matthew 5.45. He says he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. God allows both the saved and unsaved to live in this world and experience the same external blessings that reveal his goodness. Those who see those blessings and accept Christ come to realize that spiritual prosperity is far greater than physical prosperity. That the peace we have with God and the joy of the Lord and the certainty of our heavenly home are far more valuable than things, uh, valuable things than what this world offers. What sets the saved apart from the unsaved is what has happened on the inside that tr transforms how we relate to the world on the outside. While the wicked greedily hoard material things and seek power, we see the world as a temporary place to cultivate and sow God's goodness and win the lost. Of course, it's not easy because the evil do prosper. Bad things do still happen to us, as we've talked about. I once heard it put this way. When you're up to your neck in alligators, it's difficult to keep your mind on the fact that your primary objective is to drain the swamp. Don't get political with me there. <laughs> we live in a world full of evil. Our job is to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus while seeking to bring people out of the swamp and into the kingdom. Going back to Jeremiah, he was doing what a godly man should do his mission from God. The wicked were focused on their personal goals and missions, 
and by those efforts prospered in the world. Jeremiah was laying up treasures in heaven. As I said a couple of weeks ago, as Christians, we are the wealthiest people in the world because we have the Lord who is eternal. The wicked may prosper now, but without Christ, they'll lose it all someday. Our job is to take what we have and use it to get their attention and lead them to the Lord. So we've answered three common questions today. And in each answer, we've seen that God has a purpose and a plan in all things, even suffering and sickness and death. He knows which persons are truly his children and which are not. He blesses us with himself, which is more valuable than anything we can obtain on earth. Ultimately, we've learned that our perspective on these matters, and really all of life's matters, is limited. And that God, whose ways and thoughts are higher than ours, sees things as they really are and works all things for our good and His glory. It's okay to ask questions like these, so long as we look to the Lord for the answers and accept the fact that He always knows what He is doing and He is good. So when we say, if only I could understand, well, we can. We can understand to a point, but the main thing we need to seek to understand is not just the answers to our questions, but to realize that Jesus is the answer to all of our questions. Will you pray with me? Father, I come to you right now, and I am so thankful that we can go to your word, look to your word, that we can examine your character and your nature and look at our character and our nature, and we can sometimes find answers to some of these difficult questions that we ask in life, to things that kind of concern us or bother us, nag at us a little bit. And I just pray that through this message we found a little peace, that we found joy in you and in knowing who we are in you, and that we found confidence in that. And that, Lord, you'll just help us to continue to grow in you, to grow closer to you, and to seek to be that witness to those around us who do not know you, to minister to those around us who are suffering and have these questions and don't know the answers because they don't know you. Help us to be faithful to the work you have given us, like Jeremiah, to get our eyes off the, the, the problem and get our eyes on you and just be faithful to you and allow you to use us to help bring healing to the lives of those around us, both physically and spiritually, in whatever way you see fit. So Lord, we just thank you for this series now, and all that we've learned in it, and help us to realize that when we ask the question, if only I, we really need to kind of flip it around and say, because it's all because of Jesus, if only Jesus would, and that we turn and we turn whatever it is in our hearts over to you, and just let you have your way. Lord, guide us and direct us in all things now. Protect us, keep us safe, as we go through this week, use us in a way that glorifies your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me this weekend, and I hope you'll join me for Nehemiah midweek, if, if I'm able to get that out, and, and I should, but uh, hopefully I will. And then next week, it's my intention to bring a message entitled Airplane Mode. We'll talk about turning off the world and turning on our relationship with Jesus. Well, God bless you. I hope you have a wonderful week.